my third roommate in less than a year is moving out today. He's been here for 41 days. That's a new record. But to be fair, I knew he was a bad pick from the moment that I met him. I had been desperate though, and I had thought that he was a better option than unpaid bills. Still, 41 days. I am almost offended. He could have at least stuck around for the whole second month. Whatever. I'm mostly annoyed that I haven't found anyone to replace him yet. That's why I'm currently trying to word a better post advertising the room. The trouble is, I can't find a roommate that I would actually like. I don't mean it's hard to find someone who isn't impossible to live with. I mean I literally can't live with someone I would actually like. Not if I wanted them to live anyway. I know how dramatic that sounds, believe me, I do. I wish I was just being dramatic. Unfortunately, I'm being boringly factual. I can't live with someone that I would like. If I did, they'd die. I guess I should probably back up and explain that a little bit. I don't know how to write another stupid ad anyway. The thing is, I'm a monster. I'm not being self-loathing. I'm an actual monster. Some people prefer to say cursed. And I say that's BS. A curse I figure would only harm me. Or would at least harm me the most. It wouldn't kill other people horribly. I wouldn't benefit from it. Wouldn't depend on it. Thrive on it even. A curse you could learn the rules of and learn how to work around it. Avoid it or at least try to. I'm not cursed. I'm just like this. A monster. I didn't know it when I was a kid. No one teaches the rules of this crap. You don't get born with a handbook that says how to be a monster in the modern world. I had to figure it out myself and then do a lot of internet searching. I thought things were coincidences as a kid. My best friend who fell out of his treehouse and snapped his neck. My grandmother who fell asleep at the wheel and never saw that tree. My third grade teacher who had a heart attack in the middle of class. All those fish floating in the tank. These stupid little electric toys that would fall to pieces in my hands. A little string of tragedies, but nothing that couldn't be explained. I didn't notice the rush and the energy that I got every time. Didn't notice how great I felt physically in the days after. Or if I did, I didn't make the connection. It got stronger as I got older too. More I did maybe. It got harder to ignore. But it's not exactly a logical conclusion to come to. So I never made it. Until Jamie, my first girlfriend. I was 15 and I was crazy about her. I was sure that I was in love with her. We would skip class and make out at this crappy little park with broken swings. She had this ridiculously loud laugh that would turn heads in stores and restaurants. She would sneak out at night and bike the 10 blocks between her house and mine. She would stay in my bed, under my cheap and scratchy sheets until morning. I was 15 and I was the happiest that I could remember being. I watched her from my window one morning as she headed home, rushing to get there before her mom woke up. I was watching it when the pickup truck ran through the stop sign, watching in horrible slow motion as the impact knocked Jamie from her bike, sending her flying forward onto the road. I watched her land with her limbs all wrong. Watched that guy run her over and keep driving. And I knew that it was me. I knew I did. That sounds crazy, but standing at my window in shock, I knew that I had killed her. I knew that she was dead before I got there, running out of my house as fast as I could. It was a barefoot dash into the corner, trying to push a 911 into my cell phone and run at the same time. But I knew in my gut that she was already gone. I knew because I killed her. And I knew because somewhere down beneath the horror, 
Behind these sobs, I was fighting to choke back. Was a rush stronger than I had ever felt before. I was kneeling on the ground, holding her hand and trying not to look at all the ways she was twisted all wrong. And all that blood, shaking but also eclectic, like a powerful high. It was constant waves of pleasure. It was euphoria. I was floating on it even as I was screaming for help. The rest of the day is a blur. The paramedic showed up eventually. I remember them telling me that she had died on impact. I remember I didn't ask which impact they met. I know some neighbors gathered around to whisper about it all. I think my parents made it home eventually and pretended to give a crap. I shut down. Didn't talk to anyone for days. What do you say when you know you just killed your own girlfriend? When you realize that means that every other death in your life so far was you too. When you realize you're a killer. A monster. The weird high lingered too. And for weeks after that, I felt great. Traumatized as heck, but physically, I felt great. That's how it works. I know that now. I've learned all the details. Tiny internet forums and dark web corners are so helpful when you're trying to figure this stuff out. See, when I love anything, I kill it. And its death gives me this giddy high. Gives me energy. Gives me life. The definition of love seems to be shaky. For some of us, it has to be big, epic, sweeping love. Other people can do with lust. Swear they kill everyone they have sex with. Swear they like it. Swear they do it on purpose, a lot of them. Me. I can kill a plant in a waiting room if I think it's cool enough and concentrate it on it too hard. I'm really glad that I never had a dog growing up. Just all those poor fish. It's gotten stronger as I've gotten older. I think that I've hit the peak of it now. I hope I have. I've tried to focus it on plants, but it doesn't really work. They die, but I don't get much of a high. It's like when electronics break in my hand. It's a thing I enjoyed and now it's gone. But the thing doesn't happen. It doesn't actually work. My targets need to be bigger. I've tried to make myself care about bugs I don't actually like. But I can't actually seem to kill those. I guess I can't fake liking flies well enough for that. I can't ignore it either. I've tried that. Isolating myself away from everything and not letting it happen. After a few months, sometimes a few weeks, the shakes start. The full body, painful shakes. And the nightmares. The worst nightmares imaginable. Like watching Jamie die on loop forever but worse somehow. Like watching my best friend fall out of the treehouse on loop. Watching my grandmother hit that tree. My teacher collapse. Watching the bodies of everyone I've cared about pile up on loop forever. And those are the better dreams. The nightmares and shaking don't let up. And then I get pale and then the vomiting starts. And it gets worse from there. I tried to write it out once. I thought it was like an addiction. Withdrawals, you know. I figured I would either get over it or die. And neither seemed like a bad option at the time. I spent four months in absolute misery before I broke. And that's when I found the pills. A link in my forum. I don't know what's in them, but they work. Well enough, anyway. They stop the shaking and the nightmares. They don't quite recreate the higher the energy, but it's enough to get through the day. It's a lot better than buying a constant stream of cheap fish and trying to make myself get attached to them. It's a lot better than killing people I actually care about. Which brings me back to the roommate thing. It would seem like an easy solution to my problem is to just not have a roommate. But those pills that I mentioned are expensive as heck. It's not like I can get coupons on pills for monsters from the dark web. It's not like I can run them through my insurance. Keeping myself in the pills daily ends up being a huge portion of my paycheck. Way too much to afford even the crappiest studio apartment. So crappy two bedrooms it is. 
Plus, it, it's not like I can stay at a job for years and learn to love it and get promoted. I have to quit as soon as I start getting too comfortable anywhere. I don't really want bosses who have strokes at 34, or office buildings burning to the ground to my conscience. So, I have to switch jobs a lot. And that makes it hard to move up, salary-wise. Living at home isn't an option. I'm not going to get into it. But there's a reason my parents are still alive. A million reasons all added up over the first 18 years of my life. So, I need a roommate. It's a serious problem. Right after college, I killed one with an overdose. And another with a mugging that got out of control. I've been a lot more selective since then. No one I can even become casual friends with is allowed. I think it's different with a roommate then, say. The couple of coworkers that I don't hate. It's different when you live with someone. It feels like you're closer, even if you're not. That seems to be enough. Which is how I've ended up living with bad people on purpose for the past half decade. It's better that way. They've all lived, I take my pills, ignore them, and they stay alive. The bills get paid, I have a place to live, and no one dies. It's not great, but it's the best that I've got. But still, 41 days, I've got to do better than that. In the living room, Jared is stacking boxes and throwing things into garbage bags. He's on the phone, calling the friend who's helping him move out, and then I assume... He really had been a bad choice. I had overshot a bad person. Jared is totally awful. And he hates me too. Normally, that's a good thing. But Jared had seemed actively angry at me all the time instead of just quietly hostile. And he's a big dude too. At least 6'3 and he definitely lifts weights. He's absolutely the sort of guy who could kick my butt. And he spent the last three weeks looking like he's considering it. I might be a monster and all, but that doesn't exactly help in hand-in-hand -hand combat with a guy like that. I mean, what am I going to do? Become friends with his brother. Develop a crush on his mom. I guess I could if I was playing the long game. But that wouldn't exactly stop me from a black eye in the moment. And besides, I don't think I really have that in me. I can't say that I'm sorry to see Jared go. But I do need someone to pay half of a next month's rent. I turned my eyes back to my laptop screen, trying to figure out what to say. The problem is, I try to advertise for guys that I know I won't like, and it ends up at Jared. I need boring. I need to dislike the guy across the hall, but in a boring way. I want some guy that I hardly ever even think about unless half his bills are late. It's not like this crappy apartment brings in a lot of response, even at the cheap price. And even though I've tried my best to take good pictures, I only get a few responses each time. And I've done this way too many times. I start to type again. Room for rent on the east side of town. No lease required. No pets. I catch Jared glaring at me before I get going. He's just standing in the living room staring at me. Hard enough that I think it's probably time I moved out of the kitchen and into my room. He's been in his room all morning, but I guess that he's got it most cleared out now. You're so weird, dude. He bites out after a minute. He says it low and disgusted like he means it to be a cutting insult. I have to swallow it on a laugh. He doesn't know how right he is. I ignore him, closing my laptop and heading to my room. Seriously, what the heck is your problem? Jared mutters as I close the door. And I ignore that too. I spent the rest of the afternoon trying to come up with an ad. It takes hours to type a few lines. Room for rent on the east side of town. No lease required. No pets. Non-negotiable. Available immediately. Water included. Private room with a large window. A shared kitchen. A bathroom. And living room access. I'm looking for a roommate. I'm a chill young professional guy. I mostly keep to myself. The building is pretty quiet, so if you're looking to throw a party every night, this probably isn't right for you. But otherwise, it's laid back. Overnight guests are cool, but I'm not looking to live with a couple. I've lived here for a couple of years, 
It's at least takeover. You don't need to sign anything. Month to month is fine as long as you pay by the first. I stared at it when I was done, and then hit the post button. I was tired of looking at it. It's the shortest ad that I've ever put up. I've stripped most of the details out. They don't seem to be getting me anywhere anyway. Jared is gone by the time I head back out to the kitchen for some dinner. I think the overflowing garbage bag he left me on the kitchen counter is probably his final message to me. The post-it note that he stuck on top of it with, For Toby, screw you, scrawled in red marker makes me certain. It smells like he's left rotting meat in it. I decide to ignore that too. I'm pleasantly surprised to have a response when I wake up the next morning. It's brief, but it'll work. I message the guy back before I even take a pill. He's planning to come over to me by the time my coffee's done brewing. His name is Andrew, and the smile he gives me when he says, You can call me Drew, everyone does, is exactly the right kind of fake. I grin back, just as fake. I'll take fake smiles any day. If we both can fake it through this meeting, and then ignore each other for months, I'll be thrilled. He's fake in general, so fake that there's something almost creepy about it, almost unsettling. He's got this whole model vibe going on, but there's something to pinch off about it. It's probably plastic surgery, weird fillers or something. He seems like the type. He smiles an overly white smile at me, telling me something that I'm half listening to about what he does for work. So, that takes me away for weekend trips a lot. I hope that's cool, he says, fake smiling at me so hard I could almost laugh. Yeah, totally, I say. Andrew stretches one of his perfectly toned and unnaturally tanned arms over the back of the couch, like he's making himself at home already, as he says something about overnight guests with an actual wink. It's a little bit irritating. He's a little bit irritating. He's perfect. No way I can kill this guy. I'm ready to offer him the room on the spot, but I make it through a few more minutes of polite BS questions first. We shake on it before he leaves any promises to PayPal the first month's rent within 48 hours, giving me another over-the-top wink as he dies. His hands are cold and oddly smooth when he shakes mine. I wonder if he has some weird skincare ritual for those two. I'm not even sure that's a thing. I don't care all that much. He can do all the weird skincare and winking and overnight guess having he wants, as long as he stays out of my way, and stays for more than 41 days, and doesn't die. Things with my new roommates are going surprisingly decent. He keeps sending me text messages with way too many exclamation points in them, but he also actually sent me a rent payment within a few hours after our meeting. His moving has been smooth, but not smooth enough that he's not still low-grade irritating me. Hey, Toby, man. Glad you're back. I wanted to ask you something. Andrew says from the kitchen three days after our first meeting. He's unpacking an inexpensive-looking blender and some other kitchen appliances, and his back is half-turned to me as he talks. He's been moving in all day, so I've steered clear of the apartment. He looks mostly done now, down to the kitchen boxes with a towel wrapped around his shoulder, like he's dabbing at sweat even though his skin doesn't even look flushed. What's up? I asked, throwing my keys on the table. I normally try to be just a little bit of a dick to new roommates, to avoid killing them. I don't think that's much of a worry with Andrew. Even just standing there, he's managing to annoy me just a little. I drink these meal replacement shakes twice a day. Is it cool if I keep my blender and ingredients in the kitchen? He asks. Sure, I say, not bothering to hold back my eye roll. Not that Andrew notices it. Whatever, it's your kitchen too. Awesome, Andrew says. And then he turns around and levels me a strangely serious look. I'm gonna have to ask you to not touch them though, alright? This stuff is expensive. No problem, I say. 
Just as long as you're not going to try to convert me to whatever weird diet it is. I can promise I'm not, Andrew says, still strangely serious. You definitely don't look like you need it. I'm not sure what he means by that, but I think it might be an insult. An underhanded compliment or something. I don't care enough to think about it too hard. Cool, I say, nodding and walking back out of the kitchen. We don't talk for the rest of the day, and I let myself feel cautiously not terrible about this roommate situation. I don't really do optimism. It turns out Andrew is really weird about food in general. He's really weird overall. I mean, I know that I'm not one to talk, but he's weird. For one, I'm not sure when he sleeps. The light in his room is always on, and I can hear him in the kitchen in the middle of the night a lot. He has gas all the time. There have already been about a dozen people here in his first week, but he doesn't seem to be friends with any of them, or to be screwing any of them. Even though he had seemed excited about being allowed to have overnight gas. And there's the food thing. It's bizarre. About a week after the shakes conversation, I come home to find him in the kitchen again. He's using every burner on the stove and there are jars and plastic containers all over the counters. It smells familiar, but not in a good way. I can't quite place it. I don't think it's a smell I normally associate with food. Hey, he says over his shoulder. Uh, sorry about the mess. Are you going to be at this for a while? I ask. Yeah, probably. Is that a problem? Andrew asked, turning his attention back to stirring at the largest pot. I was just going to grab a soda anyway. I say back shrugging. Sorry about this, Andrew says, flashing me one of those ridiculously fake smiles of his. I need to eat soup every day for the next two weeks, so I'm trying to make a big batch while I have time. Right, I say, grabbing a soda out of the fridge. This is what I mean. He says stuff like this. That's not normal, right? I know it's probably one of those straight diets with a stupid name, but still. I would offer you some, but I don't have enough to share. He says with another fake smile, as if I had asked. I don't eat soup, I say, starting to head out and leave him to it. He turns around completely at that, though. He frowns at me like I've just puzzled him. At all? Never? He asks. He looks like this honestly worries him a little. He's still frowning. Although I notice that his frowning is a little off, too. His brow is furrowed. His eyebrows are drawn together, but it's not making any creases or folds in his forehead. His face never creases now that I think about it. No matter how big he makes that fake smile, there are never creases around his eyes. I must have been right about the Botox. Never, I say, shrugging at him again and leaving him frowning after me like I'm the weird one. I mean, I am, but it's not because I don't eat soup. Actually, it is a little. Not the soup itself, but the reason. I don't eat soup because my grandmother loved it. She used to make this huge Sunday stew in the winter. She always said that it was her secret recipe and her favorite meal. She always said there was something about soup on a cold day that made it seem all better and brighter. I don't eat anything that was the favorite thing of someone that I killed. It seems fair to me. They can't eat it anymore, so I shouldn't either. I don't know all of their favorites. That's not really a thing you learn about a third grade teacher, for example. But all the ones that I know, I avoid. So, I don't eat soup. I also don't eat M&M's or bagels or popcorn. Or chicken wings or anything from Chipotle. It seems like the least that I can do. Although, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be interested in the odd smelling soup Andrew was making in the kitchen right now, even if I did eat soup. I shake my head, opening a window in my bedroom to get rid of the smell that had crept in. This is good though. It's good that he's off-putting like this. The more that I'm just barely tolerating him, the less likely I am to kill him. 
Besides, he's still better than Jared. Nine days after that, my kitchen table is covered by three large boxes marked Onothera skincare and stuffed to the brim with bottles and jars. I'm about 97% sure I recognize the name as one of those scam companies. You know, the kind people become sellers for and then never shut up about on social media. The kind people are convinced that can make them rich but they end up costing them money. That stuff. I groan internally, hoping Andrew hasn't spent all of next month's rent on this crap. I look into a box, wondering how many hundreds of dollars this all must cost. Don't! Andrew's voice says from behind me, startling me so much that I actually flinch a little. I turn to find him rushing toward me. I hadn't even heard him come out of his room. I didn't touch them, I say holding my hands up. Uh, sorry, Andrew says, shaking his head. I didn't mean to bite your head off. Mom would just freak out if I let an unauthorized person see those early. I blink at him, completely and totally thrown by that. I was only half listening at our first meeting, but I'm almost positive he had said his mom lived halfway across the country. So, I don't know why we would have open boxes for her in our kitchen, or why I need to be authorized to see them. <laughs> Guess you didn't Google me or anything, huh? Andrew says with a forced little laugh and a wink that seems wildly out of place. What? I ask. He laughs that forced laugh again, like maybe he's uncomfortable all of a sudden or something. Onathera, he says, gesturing to the boxes. It's my mom's company. Oh, I say nodding. Suddenly, I think I get his whole deal. All the weirdness makes a lot more sense. The lack of lines in his face, the fake smile thing, the way I'm pretty sure his tan is just as fake, the overly smooth texture of his skin when we shook hands. His mom owns a freaking skincare company. He's probably been surrounded by this stuff his whole life. All those visitors he's had probably also work for his mom, or their wannabe models or something. And that probably explains the diet too. A side branch of the company or a cross promotion or something. That makes sense, right? This is a new line. I've got to get it all out to the local team leaders for review and... Andrew stops and shakes his head. Yeah, you don't care. Anyway, if you even smelled these, I would have to make you sign a whole crap little forums. Got it, I say, not even taking a step back. But these can't stay in the kitchen. They won't, Andrew says. And I'll keep them in my room for now on. Okay, I say nodding, and taking another step back and then walking out of the kitchen entirely. I do Google him that night, and I end up on the Onothera Men skincare website, where a tiny blurb above a list of expensive as crap face wash wants me to know that Andrew is the face of our men's line. I'm not sure what he's doing renting a crappy apartment, and there's also not a single Onothera product in the bathroom. Nothing in the shower or the cabinet. Even though their website tells me they sell an entire range of shower products. I briefly wonder what's up with that. I would think that you would use your own products. But maybe he's just sick of them or something. It's none of my business and I don't really care. But it does all seem strange. For the next two weeks, we manage to mostly ignore each other. We make small talk in the living room occasionally. He pays his half of the bills. He makes his weird shakes in the kitchen but keeps the lotion bottles out of it. It's exactly as boring as I had wanted. Unfortunately, everything else about the next weeks is absolutely terrible. It's just a string of crap that keeps me in an awful mood. A coworker with a pretty smile and big eyes asked me if I had plans for the weekend with a very specific tone in her voice. A very specific tone and very specific head tilt and listen. I'm a monster and not an idiot. It's a very specific. If you're not busy, you'd ask me out. Tone and vibe. For a normal person, that would be a good thing. For me, it's a very, very bad thing. For multiple reasons, first of all. It's probably obvious, but I can't date. That's just completely off the table. 
I can't have sex, but not with anyone I actually like or am all that into. I'm not a 100% sure on this one, but I'm pretty certain that the line is somewhere around thinking, hey, I wouldn't mind doing this again sometime. I mean, I could be that guy who's just in it for single night hookups, all screwing and no conversation. I'm not gonna lie, I've tried to be a couple of times. But it's difficult to get into things when you can't actually get too into it, you know. It's not exactly a turn on to be spending the whole time wondering if enjoying yourself a little too much will lead to a dead body. It's not worth it. I don't love being reminded of everything I'm missing out on though. I don't love having it thrown on my face. I get that it makes me look bad to be bitter about it. But I'm not going to pretend that I'm above it. Plus, coworkers feeling that comfortable with me probably mean I'm getting too comfortable at my job. Getting too comfortable means that I need to quit soon. And considering that there is an announcement on my forums that the price of my daily pills is about to jump up again, the idea of needing to look for a new job is the last thing that I need. It's the third increase in pill prices this year. I'm really stressed out about it. About all of it. So, I'm in a bad mood when I walk into the apartment on a Thursday night after a late shift, 32 days after Andrew had moved in. There's a blonde girl sitting on the couch with Andrew when I come in. She's holding a beer and laughing, falling into his side a little as she dies. Hey, Andrew says, noticing me. I didn't think you would be home so early. It's near midnight. I roll my eyes. Hey, I sit back, ignoring the rest. The girl on the couch stands up, eyeing me for an uncomfortable second too long. I frown. I'm really not in the mood to be social when the blonde girl walks up to me and puts a hand on my shoulder. Is this your roommate? She asks, slurring her words a little. I pick her hand up and move it off my arm, frowning deeper. Oh yeah, that's Toby, Andrew says, shifting on the couch cushion. He looks different now that I'm looking at him over his shoulder. His eyes are wide and a little nervous. He's somehow paler than I'd ever seen him. His hands are shaking. I shake my head and step away from the blonde girl. Hi, the blonde girl says, giggling before her eyes turn sharp. For a second, she stares at me so hard that I'm rooted to my spot. What are you? she asks in a way that makes every hair in my body stand up straight all at once. She's still staring at me. Excuse me, I say back, taking another step away. Drew didn't tell me that, she muses, toting her head at me. He's got so many secrets he didn't tell me. This one. Alicia, Andrew says sharply. Leave him alone, okay? I'm sure he's beat after work. Of course. The blonde girl says, turning back to him with a grin even faker than the ones Andrew normally uses. I dive at the out, practically running to my room. Something out there was weird. Way too weird. I tell myself that it's not my problem. I'm sure it's just a bad hookup. But the way she stared at me, the way she had said, what are you, leaves me feeling chilled. I'm sure she was just drunk. I'm sure she didn't mean anything real. She can't have. I have nightmares all night, even though I haven't missed a dose. Someone is dead when I wake up. I didn't do it. I can't have, because I feel like absolute crap. But I'm certain that someone is dead. In the apartment building somewhere. I take a pill and stagger to the bathroom. I know it's irrational, but I steal a glance at Andrew's door on the way. I'm sure the death that I'm feeling is a perfectly natural 85-year-old who passed in their sleep on another floor or something, but it's unsettling the crap out of me anyway. Andrew's door is half open. His room is empty. It's cleaner than mine has ever been in my whole life, and the bed is perfectly made. I stare at it for another minute. Until I hear the refrigerator door shut and Andrew's voice saying something, sounding like he's on the phone. I shake my head and take a deep breath. I feel physically awful. 
Between the nightmares and the stress and the death, I can sense uh, somewhere in the building, I'm a rag. Andrew's still on the phone when I make it out to the kitchen. He sounds angry about something, clearly fighting with whoever is on the other end of the line. He ends the call when he sees me, throwing me one of those uh, fake grins of his. Hey man, sorry about last night, he says, sliding his phone back into his pocket. He looks better than he had last night, his fake smile back in place, color back in his skin, and the ease back in his posture. Hey, it's fine, I say, waving a hand and then adding, sorry if I ruined your date. It wasn't a date, don't worry about it, Andrew says. He stepped towards me and then frowns a little. Are you okay, dude? Your hands are shaking. I glance down on my hands and notice that he's right. All this stress must be getting to me. I'm shaking like I've skipped days worth of meds. Like in the days before I knew about the pills. Yeah, I just slept like crap, I said, sitting down on a kitchen chair. I feel you on that one, Andrew says. I made a full pot of coffee. I can pour you a cup if you want. I almost take him up on it. For a second, I think that's actually a surprisingly decent gesture of him. And then I think, crap. I hope surprisingly decent isn't high enough praise to kill the guy. Nah, I'm gonna grab a shower and see if that helps. I say, standing back up fast enough that I get dizzy again. Cool. Feel free to grab some after if you want, he says. I head to the shower with my hands still shaking. The whole bathroom smells like death now. I wonder who in the building is dead. I wonder if at 33 days into living together, I've already killed Andrew. I wonder if I should ask him to move out. I wonder what that blonde girl last night knew. My hands are still shaking when I get out of the shower. The apartment building feels like death for 36 more hours. I have no idea if there's still a body somewhere or if it's just lingering for me. I've been feeling so off the past few days that it's hard to tell. At about hour 10, I considered calling the police, but I'm not sure what I would say. At hour 15, I developed a throbbing headache. My hands are still shaking. I shoved myself in my room and turned off all my lights. I don't remember the last time I felt this bad. I'm not sure why I do. I don't normally get regular kinds of sick. Not since I was a kid. I get hangovers occasionally, but not colds or the flu or anything. So I'm not sure what's up with me right now. I fall into a restless sleep filled with nightmares. Sometimes the dreams mix the desktop. My grandmother's car hits Jamie and keeps on driving right into a tree. My old roommate gets stabbed in an alley before he turns into a nine-year-old with a broken neck. In my dreams, all their eyes are always wide open. They all stare straight at me as blood pulls around their bodies. I wake up to the sound of Andrew's voice. So loud it sounds like he's shouting right in my room. I startle but my door is still closed and the lights are still off. No mom, I told you it's done. Andrew's voice says. It still sounds like he's shouting. But that's probably because my head is still throbbing. I pull my phone out from under my pillow, wincing at the light from my screen. It's 3.16 in the morning. The air still feels like death. I understand that, Andrew says, sounding awfully tense for 3 in the morning. I know, I know. I took care of it. I roll over and put a pillow over my head, not wanting to eavesdrop on any more of his phone call. Even muffled, the call sounds tense until he finally hangs up. And when I fall back asleep, the nightmares change. This time, I'm not rewatching Des. This time, I'm standing in the hallway in my own apartment, totally immobilized. In the dream, that blonde girl from the other night walks straight into my room. She opens my top dresser drawer and pulls out my pills. I try to shout, but I can't get any sound out. My feet won't move. I can't even swing my arms. The blonde girl puts my pills in her jacket pocket, and then she places a small envelope in my drawer and shuts it. 
and walks back out. She turns to look at me, smirking. She opens her mouth and says something that I can't hear before winking at me. She heads down the hallway, and I hear the front door open and shut again before I can move. I dash into my room and pull the drawer open. The envelope the blonde put in my drawer has Onathera written across it. The envelope was stained and greasy to the touch. Inside is a single picture. The image is out of focus, but I still know exactly what it is. It's a picture of my apartment building on fire. When I wake up, my head feels like it's about to split open. The sun streaming into my window is way too bright. For a second, I just shove a pillow over my head again to block out the glare. And then I remember the dream about the blonde. I jump up and dart to my dresser, pulling open the drawer and finding my pills inside. I inspect the bottle carefully, not even sure what I'm looking for. It looks completely normal, so I dump the pills still inside into my hand. They look the same as always. And then I let out a deep breath and think, of course they do. I was just dreaming. I dry swallow a pill. My hands are still shaking. My entire left arm is shaking. I make my way to the hall. The air is not quite as thick with death as yesterday. The apartment is empty. No blonde girls, no Andrew. I grab a granola bar. I make it through three bites before I throw up. I feel worse and worse as the day goes on. It's not just the shaking and the headaches and the vomiting either. My brain is getting foggy. I'm having trouble thinking. I'm having trouble keep track of time. Everything passes in waves, unlike anything i felt before. At some point, I manage to call off work. At some point, the smell of death fades. Andrew never does come home. I'm not sure if it's been six hours or a couple of days. At least I know he's not dead. Or at least, not dead in a way that I caused. There in my bathroom is hot and sticky, but I just keep shivering. I lean my head back against the wall tiles in a daze. I'm not sure what the heck to do. The pills are supposed to prevent this. For a wild moment, I wonder if someone really did switch them out on me. And then I remind myself that it doesn't make any sense because no one even knows what these do. I open up my forum on my phone. I can barely see the screen. I'm not sure when my eyes got so blurry. But the talk post catches my eye before I can start my own thread. Attention, TCX971 users, recall issued. Urgent. If you bought TCX971 between March 31st and April 10th, you might have received a bottle made with a defective ingredient. Click here to get a replacement. I close my eyes, try not to vomit again. I guess that explains it. I fill out the form and begrudgingly pay for the upgraded overnight shipping on the new order. And then I set my head back against my bathroom wall and fall asleep. I have a nightmare that I've had before. It always goes like this. I'm standing at the front door of my parents' house and I'm begging Jamie not to leave. And we're fighting. I can't remember us ever fighting in real life, but we fight in the dream. We fight, but I keep her from leaving. I hold onto her arm and keep her on my porch. Over her shoulder, the truck that killed her speeds past and disappears. In the dream, I breathe a sigh of relief. And then Jamie's limbs start falling off, one by one while she screams, until she's a pile of limbs sitting in a pool of blood on my porch. A rapping on my bathroom doorframe wakes me up. My eyes jerk open to find Andrew staring at me. Hey, he says. I have no idea when he got home or how long I had been asleep on the bathroom floor. Hey, I manage. My voice is a harsh whisper when I do, matching the way my throat is raw and painful from so much vomiting. You okay, man? Andrew asks. He's fuzzy in the doorframe and I can't really make out his face. Yeah, just my pills. I said, giving him a weak thumbs up, 
that I hope sends the message that I'm fine. I'm not sure it's very convincing. You sure you don't need an ambulance or a ride to the hospital? He asks, which makes me think I must look as bad as I feel. I shake my head, figuring I should at least let him know I'm not dying or anything. I got a bad bottle of pills, I already ordered new ones. I'll be as fine as soon as they get here. I say, leaning my head back against the cold wall again and closing my eyes. Uh, can you get a couple of emergency ones at a pharmacy or... Andrew stops and shakes his head. Right. You didn't mean that kind of pills. I pick my head back up to look at him. So dizzy I see two of him. He shakes his head, holding his hands up. Hey, I'm not judging, Andrew says. You need water or anything. I shake my head no against the wall. Okay, well, yell or text me if you do. Or... Andrew stops and reaches over to the bathroom shelves, grabbing a heavy bottle of bleach off it and setting it by my feet. Hit this against something or knock it over or whatever. I should hear that. I'll be okay. I say, but I nod and put a hand on the bleach bottle. I lean my head back and close my eyes against the wall again. Andrew's gone by the time that I sit straight up and vomit blood and bile into the toilet. Several minutes later... Two hours that feel like days and at least a dozen times spitting stomach acid and saliva up later. My phone buzzes at me. I squint down at the alert and feel my stomach drop as I read it. My pill order has been delayed. By three days. I don't know how the heck I'm going to make it that long with symptoms this strong. I just can't live in my bathroom for the next three days. Crap. I don't have a backup plan here. Until I catch sight of a shadow moving down the hallway and an idea comes to mind. It's not a good idea. It's probably a terrible one. It's all I got right now. Hey, Drew. I call, knocking me bleach bottle over too, just to make sure that he hears me. You need something? He asks, popping into the door for a minute later. Can I ask you a really weird favor? I ask as a shudder so violent that I smack my back against the wall hard runs through me. Yeah, go for it, he says. You know those little fish you feed to other fish and frogs and stuff? The really cheap ones, I ask. I know this is risky as heck. I know it's probably going to make him think that I'm crazy. Right now, it also seems better than sleeping in the bathroom. Sure, I had a turtle as a kid, he says nodding. Could you go buy me about four of them? I ask. I can give you cash. He tilts his head and blinks at me a few times, but then he nods again. Sure, he says. He draws the word out slowly, but in a that's weird but okay why not sort of way. Not in a what the actual heck way. Thanks, I say, leaning my head back against the wall and fighting another wave of nausea. I realize a few minutes after he leaves that he never took the cash from me. I realize 12 hours and one nightmare free sleep later, as I'm muttering apologies to four dead fish under my breath, my head clearer than it had been in days, that I messed up really, really badly. The memories of the past few days are really hazy. I know there had been a death in the building. I know I had dreamed about that blonde. I know my throat still feels like it's scratched raw from it all. Somehow, in between all the vomiting and the shaking, I must have ended up near delirious. I had been out of it enough that I had asked Andrew for a favor. I had called him Drew like we were friends. I had been grateful when he had brought the fish back. I think I might have deliriously thought about how he was a pretty cool roommate after all. Crap. How am I not getting better at this by now? Why do I always do this stuff? I have no idea what to do about that. I think asking him to leave would probably still count as enough concern for him that he would die anyway. Even if I started a fight and pissed him off or something, it wouldn't matter. It would be too late anyway. I think my best plan might be to tell him. I've never done that with anyone. I've never really had the chance. It seems like the least that I can do though. It might not mean much. 
he might literally drop dead on me during the conversation, but he also might give him a couple of days to prepare or something. I think I'd probably want to know. So after about 20 more minutes of existential crisis in a fish funeral, I head into the kitchen. Andrew turns around from his blender when he sees me. Hey, you feeling better? Andrew asks, throwing me a fake smile. Physically, I say. Well, that's good, Andrew says, but he makes a slightly confused face at me. I take a deep breath before I say, I'm really, really sorry, dude, I say. For what? Andrew says, raising a single eyebrow. I thought this whole roommate thing was going good. For that, actually, it is. And that's bad because you're going to die now or soon. I didn't do it on purpose, but you are, and I'm sorry. I ramble out. I'm not sure if that's blunt or unhelpfully vague. Either way, it's probably a terrible explanation. Like I said, I've never warned anyone before. I look over at Andrew, expecting him to look disbelieving or pissed or something. Instead, he's blinking slowly and then nodding. Oh, that's your deal. He says like he had just put something together. I don't have time to figure out what he means before he adds. Don't stress about it. I'm already dead, Andrew says, and giving me a half shrug. And then he laughs and shoots me an over-the-top wink combined with a raise of his eyebrow before he asks, Should I be flattered that you were worried? I had no idea how Andrew would react to my apology, but out of all the possibilities that I had run through my head, this definitely isn't one that came up. I'm kidding, he says, wincing a little when I don't respond for a second. Sorry. The flattered part, not the dead part. I thought a joke might... Sorry. What? I say because it's all that I've got right now. You can't kill me because I'm already dead. He says as if that's the part that I'm stuck on here. I mean, okay, I'm a little stuck on all of this. But the logic of dead people can't be killed again isn't the confusing part. You eat. I say probably stupidly, but seriously, what the heck? Okay, I'm just gonna show you. Andrew says, nodding to himself a couple of times, before sitting down across from me. I'm not sure what show me means, and I'm not really all that sure I want to know what it means, but I nod back at him anyway. Andrew takes a breath. He doesn't quite look like himself as he does. He looks a lot more like he had that night the blonde girl was here, paler than normal and more than a little nervous. And then he smiles. Not the fake smile that I've gotten used to in the past few weeks, with its overly perfect teeth and lack of smile lines in his eyes. No, he smiles as he looks older and younger all at once. He smiles and it's sad, but not at all fake. He smiles and his perfect teeth are gone, replaced with sharper ones that don't look all the way human, highlighted by two large teeth on either side, sharper than the rest. That can only be described as a fangs. Oh. Andrew stops after a second or two, returning his face to a normal that apparently isn't actually normal for him at all. And powdered blood packets, he says after a second, and the shakes. You probably don't want any more details than that. Oh, I say after a minute. My voice sounds a little rough to my own ears. And it's not just because my throat is still rough from all the vomiting over the past few days. I realize that I'm just sort of staring at him. But I'm not really sure what the heck to say. I don't know what the proper response to apparently other types of monsters are real too. And you live with one is. I guess I should be less surprised. After all, the whole reason we're having this conversation is that I thought I had killed him. But this feels different somehow. I had no idea. I start after a second, but don't finish the thought. I'm not sure how. That vampires are real, or that something was wrong with me. Andrew asks, leaning back in his chair. I can't tell if he's actually this casual about it, or if I looked shell-shocked enough that it's for my benefit. Either, honestly. I say, shrugging back at him. 
And then I frowned, remembering that he somehow did know something that was wrong with me. I know that the days on the bathroom floor in this fish thing might have been a clue, but still. He also seems to know that what I am is a thing to start with. I wonder if that means there's an entire world of crap that I don't know about. Corners of the internet I haven't found yet. The do of a guy to all this or something. So, is that, I guess, that can be a runs in the family thing you were born with or something? Because you said you were dead, but... I stop. I'm wincing at myself this time. Wow, sorry, ignore that. No, you're cool, Andrew says. It's just me. It is a kind of family thing, though. But not like that. It's... Seriously, you don't have to tell me anything. Unless I guess I need to know. Roommates and all. But you don't have to tell me. I say because I could be totally wrong. But I'm pretty sure there's no story that ends in vampire that's a good story, and not an awful one. I am curious, of course. I've never talked to anyone in real life and not on a forum, who wasn't just completely normal that I know of anyway. But I don't want to push the guy to tell me about his death. No, okay, you know Onathera, my mom's company, Andrew says, running a hand through his hair. I nod, feeling a little queasy in a way I don't think is left over from yesterday. Well, mom's kinda all doing whatever it takes to make the company successful. She doesn't really care if it's legal or not. She never has. So, maybe you already know this. But there's stuff that's the regular kind of not legal. And then, there's the stuff that the messed up nightmare kind of not legal. The crap that shouldn't exist in the real world, but it apparently does, kind of not legal. Right, I say nodding. I didn't actually know that, not really. But I figure my pills probably fall under that somewhere. So, mom and her top people know how to do all that. Who to contact for that weird, underworld stuff. And who you can contact with an email, and who you have to summon with a blood sacrifice. On the third Wednesday of the month, during a snowstorm, he says. He grins wirely at the last part. But I'm not entirely sure if that's a joke or not. That has to be dangerous, I say. You could say that, Andrew says, rolling his eyes. Anyway, Mom wanted me to be the face of the company and take it over one day. She had a very specific image in her mind. She's particular like that. A perfectionist, you know. So, she found ways to make me fit the image. He pauses for a second, looking away. I don't say anything. Half of because I'm not sure what to say and half because I have a terrible feeling I know where this story is going. I didn't always look like this, he says, and gesturing himself with another quick eye roll. And once I did, Mom had to preserve it, so she found a way. You can't age if you're dead. And vampires get to keep their locks. But you have to do it the old-fashioned way. My mom was willing to make that sacrifice. That's a lot to agree to for the family business, I say. I'm letting out a slow breath of my own. The tone of Andrew's voice has gotten drier than I'd ever heard it. A bitter sort of crackling I can't say I blame him for. Didn't agree, Andrew says. Sorry, I say, wincing again. It's a good thing I can't kill him because the rush of genuine sympathy I'm feeling for the guy after that story would be enough to do it. It's fine, Andrew says. And then he frowns again like he doesn't really believe that. Sorry for unloading so much on you. That's probably way more information than you wanted. My parents are still alive, I blurt. I feel stupid after saying it. But look, I'm out of practice with real conversation. They're not normally on the list of things I can do. I'm trying to say, my parents suck too. I'm not sure it's coming across very well, so I add, you know, if that helps. Andrew blinks at me for a second, sort of like he had in the bathroom doorway yesterday. And then he nods like he'd figured out what I meant by it. Right, your thing, he says. And then he shoots me a questioning look in it. I always thought that was like mostly a sex thing. Obviously not always. I had heard it could be a friend thing or whatever. But I've only seen it advertised as a sex thing. Clearly not for you, I guess. Fish and all. 
Advertise, I repeated, feeling queasy again at the thought. I know from my forums that there are people like me, monsters like me who do that. We're basically killers with it. I try not to spend a lot of time thinking about them, but it's never occurred to me that don't all just hunt solo and work alone. Yeah, I don't do that. I can. It can be a sex thing. But not always, and I don't do that. I figured, Andrew says. I don't ever even do it on purpose. I could, but I never do. Except for fish. I say, laughing a little at how absurd it sounds to say that out loud for the first time ever. But that's only when I'm desperate. You had it your whole life. Andrew asks, leaning back in his chair to grab himself one of those shake things out of the fridge. Yeah, I said nodding. Uh, how long have you been? I was 19, Andrew says. He frowns for a second, but then he grins again and adds, Don't worry, I'm not 100 years old now or anything. I'm 27. I realize as he gulps his shake that this is the longest conversation we've ever had. It might be the longest conversation I've had with anyone in over a decade. It would be better if it was about less horrifying things, I guess. But it's still oddly nice to be able to say actual stuff to someone. We're quiet for a minute until a loud knock at our front door startles the hell out of the both of us. Open the heck up! A loud male voice that I don't recognize says from the other side of the door, pounding on it loudly. I shoot Andrew a questioning look. Andy shrugs at me, looking just as lost as I am. I know Alicia's in there, the voice says. I'm pretty sure he kicks our door after he says it. Andrew pales, looking nervous again. The name sounds familiar, but it takes me a second to place it. I'm sure I pale too when it hits me. Alicia is that blonde girl from the other night. Crap, he mutters, standing up from the table and shooting me an apologetic look. I'm not gonna ask again. I'll knock this crappy door off its hinges, the dude in the hallway says. Andrew looks queasy himself as he opens the door. Can I help you? Andrew asks the guy at our door with his fakest smile yet. Where the heck is Alicia? The guy says. The giant guy who looks like he fills our entire door frame. I hope Andrew's a better fighter than I am. I try to remember everything I've heard about vampires. But then I realize that I have no idea if any of it's actually true or not. Don't know an Alicia, Andrew says, trying to sound casual. Well, that's funny, the guy says, because the tracking on her phone says that you do. I don't know what you're talking about, Andrew says. The guy swings at him, but Andrew ducks fast enough that it only grazes at the top of his head. Where the heck is she? He says again, stepping in and getting in Andrew's face. It's been days since she's answered her phone. It's off now, but the last tracking was right here. So, you're going to tell me where she is, right now, so that I can take her the heck home. Are you sure that it's this apartment? I say from my spot at the table. The guy turns his eyes to me. I don't think he saw me there before. Yeah, I'm sure, the guy says, balling his fists up again. It's a big building, and the signal in here is crappy, I say. It's not, but this guy doesn't know that. And look, I don't know your friend, but there are definitely a few dealers in the building. That part is true, but it's obviously a total gamble. Alicia had been drunk the only time that I ever saw her, but for all I know, she's a clean-cut type. Fortunately, it seems to be a gamble that pays off, because the guy slumps a little, and I can almost see some of the fight drain out of him. Gosh dang it, he says slowly. God dang it, I told her to cut that stuff out. I'm sure she'll turn up, Andrew says soothingly. Maybe he's sleeping something off somewhere? Yeah, the guy says. I hate when she does this. I thought she was cheating this time. He says that last part mostly to himself and heads away without another word or apology or anything. Andrew closes the door and then turns to look at me slowly. Hey, thanks for the save, he says, looking impressed. 
I nod. No problem, I say. If it makes you feel any better, the dude's totally abusive. Used to beat the heck out of her, Andrew says. He doesn't come back into the kitchen. He stands in the living room instead, watching me from a distance. It feels purposeful and I'm sure that it is. He knows I'm not an idiot. I wasn't worried about it, I say. Andrew shoves his hands into the pockets of his jeans and looks at me again. You can just ask me if I killed her, he says. Almost a whisper, staring at the fabric of the carpet. Okay, did you kill her? I ask. I'm not sure if I wanted the answer, but I know that I needed it. If Andrew and I are going to stay roommates, we probably need to come clean about the whole killing people thing. Maybe monsters need to stick together. Only because she wanted me to, he says, looking back up at me. She was going to die anyway. I think more has happened to me this morning than it has in the past four years combined. It's a lot to take in. Yeah, sort of, Andrew says. You can get addicted to some Onothera products. Like literally, my mom does it on purpose. It only works on some people, but it does. People can get high off them and then they get addicted. Some people lose their minds on it. And that's before it starts to eat away at them from the inside. Also, literally, I ask. I hope I'm wrong, but I'm certain I'm not. Very literally and painfully, I've been told. Alicia was addicted and she was dying from it. She was investigating the company, trying to find answers. She hunted me down. And then she found out what I am. Andrew stopped and looks troubled. She didn't want a long and painful death. And I've learned how to do it fast. I've done it before. Mom thinks that I shut her up before she went to the press, but she asked. Okay, I said nodding. I shrugged my shoulders. The last thing I'm in any position to do is judge other people's choices about death. I can't even say I'm surprised. It all fits together now. That lingering death feeling in the apartment had been because Alicia was dead in the apartment, at least for a little while. That block of time Andrew had been gone right after makes sense too. I wonder if I should be more bothered, but I am honestly not. Maybe I shouldn't believe him so easily that it had been a completely benevolent killing. Maybe I'm naive because I haven't had a friend in a while. I've never been the overly trusting type though, and I do believe him. You're not looking to break the lease, Andrew says, looking over at me. I wonder why he doesn't flee the dang country, run from his mom and from it all. I wonder if the reason is even more horrifying than all the crap he's already told me. You're not on the lease, I say, but I grin at him when I do. He shakes his head and sits back down. Thanks, he says, reaching for his shake again. Anything I can do to make it up to you? Uh, more fish or anything? I should be good. New pills get here in 48 hours, I say, shaking my head. The events of the morning hit me hard now that we're alone again. Vampires and dead girls and skincare companies with a connection to things that shouldn't even exist. Things like me. Monsters. A thought occurred to me. A reckless, ridiculous idea. I grin slowly as I think of it. Looking at my vampire roommate and thinking about a company that sells products that you can die from and that sacrifices family members for public image. Hey Drew, I said grinning at him. You know I just said I don't do the thing on purpose and never as a sex thing. Yeah, he says, looking at me curiously. I can't keep the grin off my face when I respond back to him. So, is your mom hot? I ask, fake casual and leaning back in my chair a little and still grinning. I'm out of practice with jokes too, but I hope that one landed. It seems like a good way to bring up the idea. For the record, I'm not actually planning to have sex with his mom. He is the only friend I've ever had as an adult, and that's weird. I am offering to kill her, though, if he wants. Maybe she needs an intern, or someone to really admire her business empire from afar. It seems like the friendly thing to do. And now that I've finally found a good roommate, I should make sure that he stays a while.
Drew must understand my meaning perfectly because when he nods and grins back at me, he uses his real smile. Fangs and all.